Warning, this podcast is intended for adult audiences only. We discuss sex and sexual relationships in a frank and open manner. We are not marriage and family therapist or sex therapist, and the content provided is for informational and entertainment purposes only. If you are under the age of 18 or do not wish to hear explicit discussions about sex and sexual relationships or adult language, then you shouldn't listen any further. But if you are, well, grab your seat, grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of The Accidental Swingers. We're Marina and Tristan, a longtime married professional couple in our early 50s, kids, dogs, dogs, cats, vacations at Disney World, you know, the whole nine yards. But in 2018, we decided, after years of kind of talking about it, to live a non-monogamous lifestyle. But it wasn't that easy, was it? No, it wasn't. You see, we sort of accidentally started swinging. Yeah, we did. And we found our story so humorous and fun that we decided to record and chronicle our journey for ourselves so that we could go back and listen to our adventures. And boy, have we had some adventures. Yeah, we have. In the last few years, we've found that we really love this lifestyle that we've chosen. And it's not only strengthened our marriage, but it's also helped us to grow both as individuals and as a couple. And as we began to go back and listen to our recordings, we realized that others may really benefit from listening to and hearing about our mistakes and our very candid discussions about what we were going through and experiencing. We talk about and we laugh about. We laugh a lot. Yeah, yeah, we do. We laugh about the mistakes that we've made, the crazy things that we've experienced, and the exciting things that have happened to us. But we also talk very openly and honestly about the tough times, the emotional landmines and pitfalls we had to navigate, some rougher than others. So we thought that we'd create this podcast so that others may gain some perspective or some insight and maybe even learn a lesson or two about what to do and what not to do in their own journeys. And basically, you'll join us on our journey in real time because we will include excerpts of our recordings. Some will be quick outtakes, others will be longer conversations about what we were going through or experiencing at that time. So grab a drink. Or settle into your seat if you're driving. Relax, sit back, and join us as we bumble our way through this adventure that we call The The Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Accidental Swingers podcast. This is another one of our um, new kind of series episodes, I guess we're going to call it. So I'm not sure if it's going to be episode 55, I think we're on or 54. But uh, but this is our second episode um, on the I guess we'll call it Marina's journey is kind of what it's turned into being uh, about my healthcare journey. And so joining me again today for the second fabulous episode of this series is Dr. Tanisha Wards. Hello, Dr. Wards. Hello. Thank you for having me again. Oh, thank you so much for being here. I just want to say, so um, after Tanisha and I did this, the the first episode, um, we we got some really nice emails and some really nice messages and some really nice, um, it, you know, instant messages on Instagram and things like that. And so we talked about, do we, how do we want to do this and, and talk people through this journey and this episode and, and, and things that are going on? We decided we would come on and actually talk a little bit more today about some other things because we're still um, waiting on my test results. So we'll, let me back up really quickly and remind everybody. So Dr. Wards is a functional medicine doctor. Uh, you can hear all about her on the other episode that we did, um, Marina's Journey, and it's also on YouTube. And so uh, she's a functional medicine doctor that is in the lifestyle and we are friends. And she reached out to me when she heard about me having all of my issues. And she said, I think I can help you. And I said, that would be amazing. And we talked a lot about it. And um, I said, do you mind if I share this? journey. And we really chronicle this for people because um, I was so upset that I didn't know about how to handle this myself because I, as I say, I'm a smart, educated woman, but I actually used to work in healthcare. I don't think people even know that too. Mm. So I, re- yeah, I still have some background in, in the area. And so I do know a lot of different things and I know how stuff runs and I know how things go. And so I was really frustrated that I didn't know about functional medicine and why my body was doing the things that it was doing and, and things like that. So, um, so I reached out and you reached out and we connected and, um, and started on this journey together. So there we are. So you you gave me tests to take. Like uh, first you gave me some. One of yes. your tests came in this week. Oh. I have not put eyes on it. Okay, good. I don't know if we want to pivot and just, I meant to tell you that the message came through yesterday. I think we should wait because. Okay. Um, Get them all together. Okay. Yep, full disclosure, I totally forgot about the blood work test. I was right. so focused on the and the spitting, which is all the things that I had to do that I totally forgot about the super easiest one, which was just go to the lab and have the blood work drawn. So uh, as I was preparing for this, I'm like, oh my God, I totally forgot to go get that done. So that will be done. And then we'll get all everything together. Got it. Sure yep. I just wanted to throw that out okay. there. If we got froggy. Yeah. No. So I did all the things I did. the. We actually ordered the <laughs> 
test after talking about it on the on the episode that we recorded. So I went ahead and said, go ahead and send me the test. So I did that. That was a whole thing in and of itself. <laughs> so all of doing those tests was was really quite interesting. Quick side story. Um, you I couldn't take some medications while you're doing the the food or not the food testing. I, I said that wrong last time where you're you can't eat some certain foods because they mess up with your results. And mm -hmm. so one of the things though that I couldn't take also was an antihistamine. And so of course oh. the day that I decided to start my three day you know, precursor to, to doing the spit test and all this stuff was the day that everything turned green in Florida because the allergy, the pollen had gotten so bad. So I'm still, I'm still having some upper respiratory issue just from, from not having been able to take my allergy medicine when I was doing those tests, but I was determined, determined not to let anything happen. So, uh, hopefully those were all good tests and we'll, we'll yes. get results on those. So, um, and then the other thing I want to talk about, you also gave me a couple of items or you gave all of us as listeners, some, a couple of items of things that we could do in the interim to help ourselves, um, get better and moving forward. And that was sleeping, getting some sunshine, drinking enough water, and of course, um, making sure that you're eating as whole and as close to the earth as possible. Um, I have failed epically on the no screen before bedtime. I realized that um, Tristan, we go to bed, when we go to bed, he falls asleep a lot faster than I do. And I, that's my kind of quiet downtime. And uh -huh. so I don't want to leave a light on him. I would totally play Sudoku sitting there with pencil paper. So I'm going to have to ask him if he'll wear a mask and if I can turn a light on or something. So at least I'm I'm relaxing. So I have to do some things like that. But um, but I have been trying to make sure I get outside and get my sunshine even more. We did talk about that as well. And uh, I have, I'm not great at drinking water. So I'm trying to get better at that too. Progress, not perfection. Though, and any, do you feel any different? Do you feel any, just even the little bit drinking water, any changes? Hard to say yet. It's hard to say. And yeah. we're going to talk a little bit about why that is for me. So I do feel some changes, but I'm not sure where it's all coming from. So it's all the, it's the multi-pronged approach that's, that's happening for me right now. So yeah. we're going to talk a little bit about that too. Some other things that I've, that, that I'm doing that I wanted to chat with everybody about, but I wanted to um, comment and talk about some of the, I, I want to first say to everybody who is listening and who's out there who reached out, we got both Dr. Awards and I both got messages and um, emails and Instagram, like I said, Instagram messages from folks that, um, that were touched and were so pleased to get the information or hear us talking about this topic. And I did want to read a couple of them really, really quick. And so I'll go really fast. I'm not going to give away any information of anybody. We were just so touched. And so this one says, Marina, thank you so much. I needed this episode so much. I'm struggling. I had blood work done. And again, my doctors dismi dismiss both my borderline vitamin D and thyroid results since they're either low, but within range or just below range. So exactly what you said, Dr. Wards. And so she's really struggling with that. Um, she's very frustrated hearing about, oh, you're just a mom, you're stressed. She says getting out of bed is a struggle. I'm researching functional holistic practitioners in my area. I ordered Dr. Ward's book. And so she says she would love to catch us do a live show. So we did talk about doing a live show. So I think we'll do that actually after my results, then maybe we'll do a live show after that. And then she also commented that her boyfriend is having issues. And so that he called, she called him and told Told him to listen to this episode and they together are working to find out what's wrong with both of them like they both are doing it. it together yeah and so they're both really excited and she said um that they're trying to make small changes with diet and life where they can fit it in but it can seem so overwhelming or seem like more work when life is so busy and that's what i was to say it's it can be hard to eat clean and eat fresh absolutely when you're busy and it's expensive so, you know, you have to, you have to plan, you have to plan, but I, um, I wanted to thank that person for, for reaching out. And then the other one, there were, there were plenty, there were so many, and they all very much echoed these same sentiments, the ones that I got. The other one that I wanted to read really fast, this was from a gentleman that reached out to an email, sent me an email and said, hello, I've listened to several of your episodes of your podcast and find you guys interesting and nice. My wife and I have been together for 16 years and she has experienced a major lack of sex drive. And I found your discussion regarding your own menopause very 
informative, and I would like to hear more about that. I think this is something that many women and their men should hear. So thank you very much. So thank you, sir, for sending me that email, reaching out, taking the time to actually write me in the email. Uh, that that touches my heart. Um, you can tell someone who really loves their wife too, because he's listening to this, wants her to get better, wants them to get better. And um, so that's that just, just warms my heart. Absolutely. I love it when, yeah, the husband is concerned enough, right? And, and believes them that they're not. Well, I've heard the opposite in practice a lot. Um, so that's huge. That's huge. That's really amazing. Good, good, good. Yeah. Yes. I've had yeah. some people um, reach out also everything from hormone imbalances to a patient with mold toxicity and can't get help. So anything that can help people steer them in the right direction. I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And so again, this, this is what, this is why we do this. And this is why we wanted to come on and talk to everybody. So I'm so glad that folks are getting some information and some help that they need. Since we don't have my test results yet, I thought this would be a great opportunity. I've, I've talked a little bit about this before on our podcast, but I really, you and I actually have talked a little bit about it too. Once when we were at, at an event, talked a little bit about some of the other issues that women face um, coming into the lifestyle. And so this was a big surprise for me. So I thought we would address a couple of these issues. So I, I kind of wanted to tell people, so um, when, when I started in lifestyle, so my husband and I have been together for about 26 years. So, you know, you're with the same man, you have the same penis, <laughs> the same <laughs> pH is going into your vagina, you know, the same biological fluid, you're not using condoms, you're probably not really having to use maybe a lot of lube, or you found maybe the lube that you like. And mm -hmm. you probably are using the same types of toys, you know, there isn't a lot of variety, let me put it that way, there may not be after 26 years, I will say for Tristan and I, it was healthy, we had a healthy, uh, sex drive and sex life. Um, but it wasn't anything off the chains at all. And it was pretty boring and bland. So then comes the lifestyle. And, um, and I have shared with you guys that, that I went on birth control, um, also for that, but all of a sudden your body, you know, it, my body was on fire and just like in a great way, you know, learning all these new things that it could do and all this stuff. And so now all of a sudden you're having, I'm having multiple sex partners and I'm having sex all the time and I'm exploring and all this amazing stuff is happening. So my body started going through a lot of different changes um, in a in a relatively short period of time, because by the time when we started the lifestyle, then we were like, you know, full on really going to parties and meeting folks and stuff like that. It was only a couple of months. And then it was, you know, from one sex partner to to quite a few. For me, it was very important. Uh, my main concerns about coming into the lifestyle weren't, weren't necessarily, obviously, the female issues I would have. It was, I didn't want to get pregnant and I didn't want to get an STI. And we talked a lot about that. So I used condoms. We used condoms and I, that's a big practice for me. Um, but I also found out that that condoms, which I did not know, uh, latex condoms really caused me a lot of problems. So I don't have a latex allergy. I tell people, because people are like, oh, I don't have a latex allergy, so it can't be the condom. I'm like, no, no, no. It's not, it doesn't have to be an allergy. You can have a sensitivity to different types of condoms too as well. And latex just seems to bother me um, a lot. And I didn't know this as I'm entering the lifestyle. So you're just buying, you're getting whatever condoms you have, you the cheap stuff, whatever there is. And again, trying all these different things. It may be you're at a party. You don't know what lube they have. You don't know what brand it is. Does it have... Um, glycerin in it. Some, some lubes have glycerin, which doesn't agree with some people, you know, so there's so many different things that can happen. And so my body reacted to all of those things in its 50 year old state. And, um, and I started having problems that I had never had before. So for me, um, well, I had the hormonal changes kind of going back on the birth control, which I, I did know, and I was not un comfortable with. I just knew it would happen. But I started getting yeast infections again, which I really hadn't had in a long time. I would battle them every once in a while. We live in Florida. That was not uncommon. But I had rarely, I don't even know that I'd ever gotten a UTI before, but I got that. And then um, I had never had an active case. I call active. I'd never had a symptomatic case of bacterial vaginosis before. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that, that reared its ugly head. And, uh, and then I had, was also having, so here I am having more sex, multiple partners. And honestly, it was, you know, I had rougher sex than I had been having before. And we were exploring more. I was exploring more with toys and different things and stuff like that. So 
as you guys might understand then if you can kind of, I'm painting the picture, my vagina was going through a lot. And so I, are those are those common things for, for women to experience? Yeah. So a lot of thoughts there. That is not my area of expertise necessarily doing pap and, and pelvic exams. However, I did some research a little bit on this and, and, and same thing. I am um, very particular about the lube, it being organic, very particular about condoms. Um, one thing, a couple things I thought of, and I did some research on different types of condoms and what's in them before this episode, just a, a little bit of research. I knew some things like um, alcohol could be in some of the spermicide and, and condoms. That can be an issue. And actually, let me take a step back. The vagina is a self-cleaning um, organism or, or mucous membrane, I should say, the lining of it, the mucosal layer of, of it is very similar to like our intestinal or the inside of our mouth, I guess, um, you know, cells. And all of that does have to have a very specific pH to stay healthy. And it cleans itself, which is why douching isn't necessarily recommended if everything's okay. However, it can be if everything's not okay. So what is making it not okay? And, and I took a step back and thought, okay, condoms. Yep. Yep. I'm very particular about the condoms that we use. They have to be organic. They have to be natural because a lot of condoms have a couple different things in them. Alcohol is one of them and parabens. Parabens are a preservative that I'm also very particular about not being in my makeup or my skincare because parabens can act as a synthetic estrogen, a xenoestrogen, and that can throw your hormone balance off really easily. And specifically, I don't want to name names of condoms, but the biggest one that comes to everybody's mind has parabens and alcohol in it. And that's going to disrupt a pH, the pH of our vagina for sure. So, and you're right, if you go to a party or an event, guess what's out there? The cheapest lube, the cheapest condoms, right? Because they're for lack of a better word, feeding the masses and they're just throwing them out there. So I'm definitely that girl that's like, no, 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 I brought mine <laughs> like, and, I, and, and it doesn't have any chemicals in it. And, and the reason why parabens are bad and, and they mimic estrogen, there's even some research and it says small, there's some small research saying that estrogenic cosmetics uh, skin care, hair care, things that have parabens in that can mimic estrogen can even be um, carcinogenic if there's enough of it. And, and that's got to be the perfect storm. You're putting enough synthetic estrogen into your body um, and your body has a poor detox ability. And so the body's built up with these synthetic hormones. Those are the types of things that can cause breast cancer, right? Breast cancer is either environmental or genetic. And when it's environmental, it's too much synthetic estrogen, synthetic estrogen in our meat. That's how, you know, estrogen does make us fat. It is our adipose tissue. It's what our breast tissue is mostly made of. It, it Estrogen fattens up cows and, and chickens. That's why they inject it in there. So a paraben can act as a synthetic estrogen, which can sit on your estrogen receptors and build up and your body can't get rid of them. And so specifically... I do believe that that can throw off your hormone and pH balance in the vagina, that, that specifically the parabens in it. So my thought is it's what's in the condom that's upsetting the vaginal pH. That's probably a big part of it. So yes, it could cost more to have a certain condom. It definitely, you just may be more sensitive to it or your hormones may already be a little out of balance and, and putting some of this in because hormonal imbalances can cause the vagina to be out of balance and pH different times of the cycle. Our hormones are fluctuating, right? So we can, we're more susceptible to having sensitivities or issues or the pH going out of balance there. That's definitely the condoms and the lube. I think it matters what's in our ingredients. And that's something that a lot of us just aren't thinking about. Like, oh, we don't know what chemicals are in there. And spermicide too can also have alcohol in it. And that may upset the vaginal pH. So that's definitely one part of it. Um, toys and things, you know, what are they made out of? Are the, is the person sensitive? Um, speaking to bacterial vaginosis a little bit and yeast infections, I've heard that in the lifestyle to be a big one. Yeah, you're definitely being exposed to more things, more people's microbiomes, right? And so E. coli is one of the big um, bacterias that can cause bacterial vaginosis. Um, I had a midwife tell me to never wear thongs, that that little string can 
make bacteria go from the rectum back to the vagina. And then you get E. coli in your vagina and absolutely in the lifestyle, we're wearing outfits and we're sitting in places maybe with a G string on, or we're in hot tubs and pools in some of these events, all of that, a hot tub for sure can change the pH of the vagina and that can be a breeding ground for bacteria. So thinking about all of that, definitely more exposure to infections to toxins, to things going in there that aren't natural. I did not even think about the thong piece of that. I always mm -hmm. thought that that I, they always say like, um, um, a lot of times not to wear underwear. If you can go commando, if you're having like a yeast infection or something, mm -hmm. just so that you're getting air. And, and mm -hmm. so, that, but I, so in my mind, that was always what that was about was not, was about air. I would also say, so for me, the, the biggest thing was the bacterial vaginosis that, um, I didn't know. So for me, the bacterial, the bacterial vaginosis, I did a lot of research on it when it was, when I was going through it because I got it the first time and, um, and I thought it was a yeast infection slash UTI, which is what I went to my doctor for. And she said, no, it's this fabulous third thing that, uh, that I hadn't heard of yet. And so it, it, it felt like it was those two things, but, um, the, the key difference, I think she said for that was kind of more of the, the unpleasant fishy odor, I think that the BV tends to cause. So that was kind of my key. And that's my clue now too. If I'm starting to feel some discomfort, I'm like, mm, which way this is going to go. I know from my research and the things that I've done, what I can do for myself to, to kind of combat it, hopefully before it gets to kind of a flare up stage with me, the, uh, the BV came back very quickly. Um, I read that, that that is not uncommon and kind of almost, you have to anticipate that it's going to come back. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. and it's not that it's, and it's very, 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 very common. It's very, very common. And it is like very I, common. I think even mm -hmm. most of us have it and don't even know that we have it. Just, just, it's just an imbalance of the bacteria within your vagina. But when it gets totally out of whack, that's when we get these other problems. And so, um, so for me, the, you know, she put me on the antibiotic, I think, and then maybe even a cream at the time. I think it was a two pronged approach. And I'm like, Ooh, I do not. And then I got it again, like three months later. And I'm like, I don't want to be going on an antibiotic, which is going to screw up my gut mm -hmm. and having to do stuff every three months. Like, is this? And she's like, that's kind of, you know, you got kind of what happens. And I'm like, well, I don't like that answer. Same doctor that also, you know, this started, a lot of this stuff started with the same doctor, <laughs> but I said, I don't really, that's not a great answer for me. Three months on act of, on antibiotics every three months is not going to work because then I'm going to get. Well, then you might get a yeast infection so because I you're killing your good bacteria. Some changes in my diet and some things like that. So for me, um, obviously sugars feed yeast and things like that. Um, so I'm trying to really, really cut down on all those sugars, but that really helped a lot. And then for me, it's just doing more of, um, I'll do even a daily organic cranberry juice, kind of a, just take a swig of cranberry juice every day. Cause I know it's good for UTI and it seems to help with this kind of stuff. Are mm -hmm. there other things that people can do? Ultimately, I think everything comes down to the microbiome in the, in the, in the vagina. So everything has to work as a, in a symphony. We can't have too much of a good bacteria or too much of a bad bacteria. It all has to be in balance. Same with our gut microbiome. So if any of that's disrupted, which I do think things like condoms and lube, lubrication, toys, anything with, with like we mentioned, um, parabens or alcohol can absolutely disrupt that. And, and it's almost like knocking your immune system down, right? You're exposed to something and now these little colonies have to rebalance. So oftentimes women may be going into situations with a weakened vaginal immune system because the microbiome's out of balance. And then you are more susceptible to any bacteria that could be, or any even fungus that could be entering the vaginal canal. But if all of that's in balance, you're going to be stronger and not get the infection necessarily. So I, I do think that maybe we're more susceptible to these things because the, the microbiome's having to constantly rebalance itself. And bacterial vaginosis can be caused from a lot of different bacteria. E. coli just happens to be a common one that we see cause bacterial vaginosis, but any bacteria can get in there. Streptococcus, there's all different bacteria that can be inserted and cause a disruption. And, and I think a couple tips and tricks to know if it's more BV or yeast infection, there's kind of a compare and contrast. Bacterial vaginosis often does have, as you mentioned, more of a fishy smell, um, and it can have a green or a yellow discharge, 
where yeast is more like a sweet smell. Like think of like yeast and bread rising, kind of a sweeter smell. And it usually has a white discharge. I know we're getting in there. And, and yeast is a fungus. And yes, it could come from wearing a G-string or thong. Yes, it could come from a bacteria getting on something, a toy, somebody's hands, you know, their fingers can have bacteria, their mouths can have. A lot of people don't even realize they, they suffer from thrush, which is a white coating on the tongue, which is essentially yeast. And then they could pass a yeast infection to a woman vaginally. There's just so it's, it's, it's really actually easy to get a lot of these infections, especially with multiple partners. So all we can really do is try to keep ourselves as healthy as possible, building our immune system, balancing our microbiome. And honestly, um, probiotics would probably be my first thought and line of defense for women from vaginal uh, bacterial vaginosis and yeast. So a probiotic made for women and women's flora of vaginal flora would be a good one. And I actually have, I have some really good natural alternatives to treat bacterial vaginosis and yeast. One of them is a, um, a, a douche regimen that I actually got from a midwife who's been delivering babies longer than I've probably been alive. And she wrote out this, this, um, douching regimen, and I'd be happy to share it with anybody who wants to reach out. It's eight days long and you're douching with things like, um, tea tree oil in a couple drops of tea tree oil in a, in a, in a douche bag or yeah, a bag or a bucket you can get apple cider vinegar and water. So it's diluted boric acid and then probiotics. You could literally put plain yogurt or open a probiotic cap into the water, mix it and douche with that. And then you repeat it. So it's four separate days, repeat it. And I'll send the, the recipe out. I mean, I'm happy to, you could post it somewhere. Yeah, um, we'll, put that's, it, we'll put it on the website and we'll put it in the show notes. So that, and when you have a bacterial or, or yeast infection vaginally, you can't just treat it from the from the outside or just the inside. You kind of have to hit it both angles, inside and outside. So I also recommend taking either oregano or garlic orally versus antibiotics. So now we're not killing our gut microbiome and we're, we're, we're using killing agents that will go after these. I do think that garlic is a little better for bacteria and oregano is a little better for fungus. And they'll go after these bad bacteria without killing our good probiotics and at the same time replenish with a probiotic specifically for women, especially, and look, I think there's a time and a place for antibiotics. Absolutely. Do I think every three months is right? Absolutely not. Because I think that will do more damage than good. So let's look at prevention or, you know, whatever, um, we can do to get ahead of that. But if you are put on an antibiotic, you absolutely want to be on a probiotic to replenish what they're killing. Cause antibiotics are like going in and wiping out everything good and bad probiotics. Right. And the body will rebalance that, but it takes time. And if we can help reimplant that, let, let's do it. And then absolutely bacteria, fungus, even cancer grows on sugar. It feeds off sugar. We know that refined sugar. So absolutely cutting, you know, a lot of the refined sugar out is going to, to make you stronger and less susceptible to these infections. And one thing we mentioned on the last podcast is how much alcohol is part of the lifestyle and staying up late and doing all the things some, at these events that lower our immune system. And that's kind of the perfect storm. And then, you know, somebody touched something and touched their mouth and touched their bottom. And then they, you know, <laughs> used a toy and had their hand on it and now it's in you. And so there we go. That's kind of what happens with it. And then we had the chemicals from the cheap condoms. And so our whole vagina is like, what's happening? Why is there alcohol in this? kind of thing. So that, that's kind of the perfect storm of what happens. I also have a really great, and I am going to send this to you really great, um, cranberry concoction. It's apple cider, vinegar, cranberry, lemon, and water for UTIs. And so after a really wild night, I would say, make this concoction. You know, if you had a lot of exposure to things vaginally, maybe do a douche and do a probiotic <laughs> the next morning. There's our new cocktail for post swinger events. <laughs> you know, and I never, I never thought about that either. And I, I was going to say, I wanted to, we don't want to scare the crapola out of everybody here, you know, and, and if you are not in the lifestyle and you're a, a listener who happened to find us from the topic because you're, you know, 
interested in this topic, you know, all of those things are part of the risk assessment that we always talk about that you have to be comfortable with your own risk about what you're going to do and, and you as a couple in the lifestyle. And so that's something else you have to think about. These are things that, um, and that's kind of why I want to talk about them because this is something I never, no one ever talked about because I don't think anybody really ever put two and two together. But for me, it was so obvious that instantly, as soon as I enter the lifestyle, I was having all these issues. And so I love the idea of being, um, proactive for it. I, I forgot I've run out of probiotics. I used to take them with my swig of cranberry juice and I forgot. And so uh, they used to be in the fridge. And so I, I need to order some more. The other thing too, I was going to ask you, have you seen, I know that you can do, and I do um, insert a boric at, acid capsule. Um, mm -hmm. I use the one I will mention, Love Honey. Um, you do not have to buy the expensive Love Honey one. I found them on sale and I just really like them. And it's just, you know, it's nice because they're in a little container and I mean, a little foil package and whatever. So I throw them in my bag. Um, but they also, they do a, they call it, I think it's Flora Power mm -hmm. with Love Honey. And that one, I believe is a, is that a, I think that is a, um, a probiotic suppository, a vaginal suppository as well. I think it's a probiotic, right? Absolutely. And, and I should say too, there's boric acid that you put around your house to kill ants. Yes. And, and there's boric it. acid that can be taken orally and internally other places. So make sure you go to a health food store or, you know, a doctor's office to get these. Absolutely. There's boric acid that has probiotics that you can insert vaginally. Say midwife gave me some tips and tricks of, um, you could just insert a probiotic vaginally and the capsule will disintegrate and the powder will go in and reimplant flora. It doesn't have to be a suppository, although those are a little easier to do. And, and I, I have patients do that overnight, the boric acid probiotic suppositories, or just a probiotic, yeah. the one you're taking, you can insert, put a panty liner on because it may get a little messy. Um, overnight, another tip and trick from a midwife that I picked up years ago was garlic insert a garlic clove peeled vaginally overnight and that will kill anything. And that's her tip and trick. Oh, you have a yeast infection, put garlic in there. Oh, you have, I know it sounds wild, right? But these are the things that we have done and, and do without bacteria and it works, but there has yet been a patient with, and I've had some patients again, um, not my specialty, but we talk about all things in functional medicine with some really bad um, bacterial vaginosis. And this douche has yet to fail with anybody. If you're taking things orally, you're cutting the sugar, you're stop, stop feeding the bad bug, starving it, killing it, replenishing. It works every time. And so would I say do that necessarily preventatively? Not if everything's working and the vagina again is a self-healing mechanism. It's got its own flora. It's going to balance it. But if you think you're exposed to things, I think it could help. It could get ahead of it doing some, I would probably say the most gentle douche would be one with a probiotic. Just open a capsule, pour it in the bag or put a couple of scoops of plain yogurt, shake it up and douche with it. I think that would be a really good prevention if you don't have an infection, but you're prone to them after experiences. And again, the same, I think the, uh, the love honey is the same type of, actually there's are capsules. I may have said it's I think both of theirs are capsules. I bet but, you could find um, both. I bet you yeah. could find either at any health, great health food store. I mean, maybe even like a whole foods would have it. Probably, probably. I think even our, our local grocery store has stuff like that, that you can use. Mm -hmm. But, um, yes. And the other thing too, that not only make sure that you're getting the right kind of boric acid, do not think that you can orally take a boric acid that you can vaginally insert. That's a very big no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Check that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Besides, I just want to apologize to the men listening <laughs> that we're talking about all the things that we're talking about right now. Just hang with us. We'll get through it. <laughs> right. But here's the other thing too. This is an amazing thing to help your wife. And if she doesn't know, or if she's just like, man, whatever. I, and you gentlemen sometimes can detect the changes before us ladies can, if you are orally servicing your partner or absolutely fingerly servicing your partner and you may smell something or whatever. Uh, there have been many times where I'm like, Hey, Tristan, is everything going good down there? Like, you know, or he'll be like, Hey, honey, you might, uh, you know, just, uh, let you know, not as quite as fresh as you normally are. And I'm like, Oh, good to know. And so, so that's important to know. And there are ways that we can take care of this and, and be proactive about it because, um, yeah, I didn't know anything about the boric acid and I didn't know anything about having, um, probiotic that was specific for vaginal issues health. and health. Mm -hmm. and so yeah, that, that had made a huge difference as well. Men can also pass these, mm -hmm. um, 
men can pass yeast. It's just, it's a fungus called candida. Men can ca- pass bacterial vaginosis asymptomatic without symptoms, especially if they're uncircumcised. There's a lot of bacteria that can get under there, um, but absolutely it can live right in the urethra and they can pass it. Of course, obviously safe sex and condoms. Now we're dealing with more of the chemicals and the condoms we're sensitive to, but, but like your partner can pass that. And so that's, that's another thought, right? Is, ah, if, if, pers- if a person keeps getting, in fact, if they come into my clinic and they get, they're having recurring yeast infections or recurring BV, I typically say, have your husband take a jar of this garlic and have him stop eating sugar for about three weeks. And then it usually stops the cycle. Yeah, we we were the same way too. I think uh, at one point in time when I was getting them so often, I, I I had asked the doctor, is it possible? And she said, yeah, it's possible that he wouldn't have any symptoms because he doesn't have the same plumbing that I do, but it's mm-hmm. just living in his body or on his penis or wherever and definitely can get, you know, reinfected or and there is nothing that will derail our sex drive as women as a dang yeast infection or bacterial vaginosis right like don't touch me don't get near me i'm miserable i'm uncomfortable i can't even sit (laughs) without being angry (laughs) right so we want to avoid those Absolutely. Right, absolutely. I would love for you definitely to please send those um, those recipes and those tips and tricks along. And like I said, we'll definitely put them in the show notes and then on the website uh, for the show notes of that as well so that people can get that. And I'll try and also put a link maybe in the Instagram post that we do about it or something like that. So the, uh, it just came to me. The brand that I do like that has a vaginal um, probiotic is it, that you can get over the counter, not through just a practitioner is Jaro, J-A-R-O. J-A-R-R-O-W. I know for sure that they have a vaginal rebalancing probiotic that, that I was trying to think of it earlier when you said the other brand, not that I promote any brand necessarily, but I know that you can get that at um, your regular grocery store. I have tried as the probiotic, just the regular probiotic. I think it's Garden of Eden that makes a woman's, and it's a pink label. Garden of Life. Garden of Life. Garden of Life. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh Highly recommended that one. I think it's it's a highly, highly rated one on Amazon and things like that. And that's actually the one that my doctor recommended way back when. And most of the most of the people I know take it just because it's a, a, an easy one and very, mm-hmm. very good. I've never had any problems with it. So excellent. And then of course we can eat yogurt, pro you mm-hmm. know, proactive, all those things that we talked about before, all that stuff that we should be doing anyways to be healthy for our body. So um, but it's it's amazing how everything all works together. The other thing too, I was going to say when we were talking about the condoms and stuff earlier um, about the sensitivity to the condoms and things and all these things that you're putting in your vagina now and all the difference. I mean, think about it really, truly think about it. different sizes, penises that are now touching you in different places that you mm-hmm. hadn't really you know, felt before. And if there's a condom on it, like I say, my, my vagina was sensitive to it. I always felt like at the very beginning that I, it, I felt like, um, like my insides were just, it was like, I could never get enough lube and it just felt like the condoms were so rough on the inside of my body. And so the brand that I like, um, I can use very, not a lot of lube with, it just works well with my body. So don't be afraid, go to the sex store and, and find, and go through and look at all the different packages and read the packages online, but then see, grab a couple singles from the different samples, you know, they have at the sex, at the toy store, they'll normally have like a wall with all different, you know, types of condoms and see, but the cheaper ones are going to have all the crap in them. Yep. And so that's what you just have to be aware of, you know? Yeah. Yep. I could tell a lot of funny stories about, um, boxes of condoms showing up at my house and us practicing to figuring out which one my husband does like <laughs> never thought think, we'd be here yes, <laughs> and which so one I like true. which one is organic and natural and doesn't have chemicals in it and things like that yeah yeah mm-hmm. Tristan uh yeah Tristan has a bunch <laughs> he's he's trying a bunch from the the one company I don't mind talking about that uh we like the skin condoms s-k-y-n those are the ones that I like and that I carry with me and I talk about it all the time um we don't get anything from them. These are just the ones that I like. And, uh, and so, but he's been trying the one condoms cause they make the custom sized ones. And I've so, heard about this. Yeah. 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 So he's going to do an episode mm-hmm. about it to talk about it. So he, we are also, I mean, I, we practically could have a house party and supply everybody on the planet with a condom because he just keeps, and they, nope, it's so dumb to buy, <laughs> you don't buy three, you have to get 12 or 24. And it's like, you know, and I don't like practicing with condoms because I don't like using them. So the last thing I want to do is the two people that I can have sex with that I don't use condoms with, I'm not using condoms with them. So it's like, I'm sorry. I don't like 
condoms. I don't like practicing with condoms. I have to use them enough as it is. So <laughs> skin is one of the brands that you can get a couple of theirs that have no parabens in them right, that I mentioned. Right. Yep. Yep. Right. So they are more natural. They are more organic. They do cost more, right? Yeah, like do. that is, yeah. So that is a thing. So you're not going to find them out and about it is easy, right? You have to order them and be intentional about that. Mm -hmm. Right. But for me, it is so worth it because when I am, when, when stuff flares up for me, it'll, uh, it can cause me a week's worth of uncomfort, just discomfort, not even not talking about sexual, yeah. you know, not being able yeah. to have sex with people. I mean, it is uncomfortable. I'm miserable. Yeah. So for me, uh, whatever costs $2, $3 to have sex, it doesn't matter. It's worth, it's worth whatever that is. Um, to protect myself. Anything else about that? I, I appreciate talking about all this stuff. Anything else about other things or other things that might pop up for us as we get more active in our middle ages in our lifestyle with having all these new partners? Or in my mind, I equate it a lot to people who are um, going through a divorce or I heard somebody talk about a marriage liberation. She went through a marriage liberation. <laughs> I like that I was fabulous <laughs> for her, for both of them, I suspect, but where all of a sudden, you know, you've been with somebody for a really long time and now things are changing for you and you might be dating again and, and all these different types of things at this age. Are there any other things that we need to be aware of? Gosh, I do think that was a really good conversation talking about the differences of infections and condoms and yeah, yeah I think just being, you know, just learning your body and what works in your body and what prep, like you said, and what you know, what things you have to do to keep yourself healthy. It's, it's all going to be a little bit individual. Some people may have the same experiences and, and their microbiome balances and they never get infections. Right. So just knowing what your body can tolerate and what it can't and what you can do to recover and help it. And I think don't be afraid to talk to your practitioner or your doctor about mm -hmm. it, or even your friends, talk to your friends about it. And, and you know, if you can, if, if you can get resources or other people try stuff and don't be afraid to spend some money to try some different things too. Like you mm -hmm. may buy the bottle of this and it doesn't work great see if a friend needs it or something. I hate throwing mm -hmm. things away. I'm like, does anybody want this? Does anybody want this? You know, I don't use it or whatever, <laughs> but, but don't be afraid to try those different things. Cause if it doesn't work for you, then there, there may be something else that does. And it may be the thing that didn't work for anybody else, but it works great for you. So don't be afraid to try. And having those conversations with partners, right? Yeah. Like let's, let's not that we have to be sanitary here, right? We're not, we're not, you know, building a surgical center, but <laughs> let's maybe make sure you know, we're being mindful of, of certain things and, yeah. and infections and all of that. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. In your own play areas and things. <laughs> things I think about, I probably overthink about that kind of stuff. Like <laughs> sure in the moment, knowing too much, like, Ooh, <laughs> I'm sure you do. He was just in that hot tub. <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah. It can be hard in the, in the heat of the moment to go, huh, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> We've all gotten, I've, I'll, I'll admit I've been a little bit like, oh, now we're, we're just going to move forward and I'll deal with the, I'll deal with the repercussions later because we're moving forward. So, <laughs> so you deal with it later and you Love jump it. out of bed and run, take get a huge glass of cranberry juice. <laughs> cranberry juice, probiotics. I'll be right back. Yeah, right on the side of the bed. Yeah. So the other thing I really wanted to talk about, and I forgot to even mention this in the, in the prelude to the, to the episode was the other hot topic that is really on everybody's tongue. And we talked about this. We've been talking about it actually for a couple of months, actually even before we started, but this is going to be, I wanted to talk about a little bit about uh, semaglutide mm -hmm. or for those of you who don't know what that is, kind of the the hot drug that is every, on the tip of everybody's tongue. And I guess it, I didn't even know that it was a big um, YouTube thing, uh, or sorry, TikTok, TikTok thing. And um, Hollywood, but, Hollywood is calling yeah. it the skinny shot. Yeah, the skinny shot. So it's the Ozempic, the uh, Zagovi or whatever it's called Wagovi. or whatever. Yep. But it's a, for me, I call it semaglutide. I want to talk a little bit about it and I want to um, talk about my experience with it. So, um, so yeah. can you, can you talk a little bit about, I know it's not, I know this is not your practice. I do. I wanted to preface that or let you preface that, that this is not part of what you actually do, but yeah. you have a little bit of experience with it. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of what it does and where your, where your experience is? Yeah. So it does two things that we know for sure. Um, it, the first thing that it does, it, it inhibits glucagon secretion. And, and that is balancing your blood sugar essentially. And so it's lowering your blood sugar. So you're not having sugar cravings. Sometimes people aren't even wanting to eat. They're not even having cravings. They're not even, it's not even triggering hunger at all. That can be good and bad. 
um, that can be bad in that you need sugar to an extent. I know we talked about refined. I was talking more about refined sugar feeding those bacteria, but we need sugar, you know, for muscle, for, for glucose, for, um, everything. Our body needs everything, but getting it from places like fruit and and vegetables and, and natural sugar is different than refined sugar. So it definitely lowers blood sugar and that will reduce cravings and hunger. But also, and what I don't love about it is it, is it slows down the acid, the gastric emptying from your stomach. So it slows down digestion essentially. So you feel full longer, which both sound like great things, but there are some side effects to it. So I could argue both ways. I could argue the effects of obesity and how bad that is and inflammatory on our body and how hard that is on our joints and our muscles and our liver and our heart um, to carry extra weight. Absolutely. Not even just our self-image and our self-esteem. And I know Oprah just did a whole episode a lot on self-esteem and, and carrying weight. And that's that's real. That's real. And that develops into eating disorders and psychological issues and, you know, things like anorexia and bulimia. So definitely being overweight is is a problem in an epidemic. So a lot of people are like, oh, this is the miracle drug. And it is for some people used properly and used well, but it does not come without side effects for most people. Um I've seen, I've seen everything from, um, hair loss because they're not eating enough food and skin issues and muscle tone loss to, um, a lot of GI issues. My husband tried it for a while and had terrible heartburn. He had all the, the issue, the, the side effects of the heartburn and the burning and the GI issues. And he just, he just didn't even do it a month kind of thing. Like this isn't worth it. I feel terrible. Um, a lot of people have a lot of loose stools and, and the problem with that is, um, if you're having a lot of loose stools, that then is causing an issue with the gut microbiome and absorption. And that's where we see the hair loss. If you're just not getting enough nutrients. I mean, I've seen clumps and clumps of hair coming out with it. So there are side effects. And also I have found patients do really, really well on it. Here's, here's what has to happen in my opinion. If you're eating fast food multiple times a day, and now instead of getting a super size, you're getting a happy meal because your, your appetite is less. Yeah, that that's that's you're probably going to gain the weight back. That's the other thing that we're seeing happening. You know, because when you go off the medication, guess what? You're not staying full longer and you have the cravings again. So you're eating the same things, now you're just eating more of it again. That's the problem. Where I've seen patients completely in clinics work with nutritionists, which we have a nutritionist in our team. Again, we're not we're not prescribing this, but we teach people how to eat properly and they're they're now eating more fruits and vegetables and whole food nutrition, actual real food, not things from a box or a package or wrapped. You know, they're eating fruits, fruits, vegetables, protein. That's what they're really focusing on. And they're losing the weight and they're coming off of it. And there's a progress to it. And most of, most of them dose you low and you slowly work up, right? So you're a little less hungry than you're, you know, definitely not having cravings and not all that hungry. And then some people are having to remember to eat. They're having to set their alarm to eat because the problem with that is, you, fasting is good and it has all these benefits, but people are going sometimes two days and they're like, oh, I haven't eaten. And guess what? Now they're, now they're having blood sugar crashes. And that's a problem too. That's stressful on the heart and then the adrenal glands and, and the pancreas. So, but done right. And you go in a low dose, you come up and then you come back down from it and you change your eating habits. People are keeping the weight off. I'm seeing it. I mean, I, I've seen patients who have been off of it almost a year and they've kept it off. And I've seen patients off of it almost a year and they've rebounded. And they've gained even more weight because they're still going through the drive through right? They were just eating less. And, and you can, there are some studies showing that, um, you will lose muscle tone really quickly. So a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not hungry. I'm hardly eating. So I'm not working out. And so if you're taking it and not working out, you're going to lose muscle tone and fat with it. You just are. So there's a lot, you know, it, it does have a black box warning label of people who have a, uh, history of thyroid cancer. So that's a problem. Now, does that translate into also people who have hypothyroidism? Not technically, but that's concerning. A lot of a lot of patients that I've worked with that have considered going on it are like, oh, well, I'm hypothyroid and it and it does have this warning. So I'm just not going to, even though the, those are two different things. So what I don't know about it is what does this look like five, 10 years later? Are there effects of it? We just don't know yet. Right. And and I go back to the 90s where everybody did FinFan, I think it was. Yeah. And everybody lost a ton of weight, but then people were having all these heart attacks, right? So we don't know that. So that I've been kind of stepping back and watching and, and seeing that, but I've seen it go 
fantastically well and people drop 30 pounds and they are a different person, right? They're, they're um, no longer pre-diabetic or diabetic, which you can take it if you're not diabetic. That's the cool thing about it. You know, it was being prescribed to just diabetics and now it's approved as a weight loss drug. So we're seeing diabetes reverse. We're seeing, you know, heart disease go down, inflammatory levels go down because, because you're getting rid of fat tissue, fat tissue holds toxins and chemicals and hormones in it. And we're getting rid of that. And so you're less, you have less free radicals in your body. And so you're less inflamed. So I'm seeing amazing things happen that just weren't happening with diet and exercise for whatever reason. Right. And, and so of course I, I'm probably more a proponent of diet and exercise and let's do it naturally. Sometimes you need that nudge and that that kickstart. And that's where I've seen it be successful. People kind of never really max out at the higher dose. Most people, I, I would say from my ex- clinical experience watching, almost everybody has some GI issues at the highest dose where they're having diarrhea all day or, you know, all week kind of thing. And that I question what's going on with the gut there. And are we absorbing any of our food? And we're going to have ramifications of that. But I've seen people not quite hit the highest dose and come back down, keep the weight off, change their eating habits, and they're still exercising. They're doing amazing. That's where I'm a proponent. And you and I talked about this because, uh, well, we all talked about it. I think we put you on a group call. Yeah, you um, asked me what I thought about it. I think yeah, to ask you before what, going yeah. on it, and I was like, we can argue both. Let's talk. Right. So the four of us, our our quad, um, we've been really talking about um, about we've always worked together as a, as a team to help each other with our, our diet and our exercise. And we also hurt each other as a team with our diet and exercise because I can relate to go out and eat and drink. (laughs) And so, uh, you know, that's, that's what we do. But the four of us were really talking about it because, um, both Tristan and Phoenix, um, were having just some, uh, you know, issues and things like that. And, and, um, Crimson and I are both feeling overweight. We're both overweight. Um, I won't speak for anybody else except for myself out of the four of us. But um, so for me, um, I'm not a tiny little person. I'm I'm over six feet. And um, so I'm never going to weigh 150 pounds. But um, I've struggled with weight all my life. The typical kind of, you know, I was a big, I'm a big person. I'm a big kid. I was a big kid when I was a you know, teenager and then went to college and then everything bloomed up from there. And it, at my highest, I I probably topped out around 240 pounds at 6'1". And that's a lot for a lady. <laughs> and, um, and so I really battled that for a really long time. After my oldest was born, I found Weight Watchers. Mm-hmm. And Weight Watchers was the first one, the first program that really taught me and that I was able to learn how to eat and I was able to learn how to do things for my body. And I was able to learn things that worked for my body and that, you know, other diets, when you have to follow this, maybe that wasn't the best for me. And it was the first thing that really worked for a long time. So I actually made my goal weight with Weight Watchers, um, got pregnant, had a second kid, all this other kind of stuff, ballooned back up, um, up and down, up and down all my entire life. So what happened with the Weight Watchers, though, was I was able to kind of get down to a weight around 215 to 220 pounds, which kind of became my new normal. And so I was kind of there for a long time. So I would like lose 10 pounds, gain 10 pounds, but it was always within that kind of 215 range. And then did um, kind of really paid attention, really worked hard, did, you know, thinking about what I was again, eating more of a paleo type of a diet, Mm -hmm. more, you know, clean eating. Um, exercising, all those things. And gee whiz, when you put all that together, you start to lose weight again. And I was losing it in a healthy way. And so I was able to get down again to about um, 190. And that kind of ended up being my my point where everything kind of would go up and down from that point. So I'm still not at my goal weight. My goal weight for someone my height is about 170. And so, um, and my body type, I'm also a large boned person. So anyway, so... um, so for for us, for me, thinking about going on the semaglutide was a piece of, can I do something to help reset that kind of point in my body to get to where I'm close to a, a weight that's better for my body and better for me as I'm moving older into this age? And yes, if I go up and down, but I'm, if I can lower that point again one more time, that was really kind of the goal for me. And so... Um, we we all went and you have to meet certain guidelines what i wanted to say for me so that my bmi was high and was over i think it, i think with the semaglutide if you're not diabetic you have to have a bmi of a certain range and then you have mm-hmm. to have some kind of something that's a weight related issue and so like a high cholesterol or high blood pressure mm-hmm. or pre diabetic 
um, something like that. And I had things that were all very low range of those things, but there was all kind of like on the borderline of I could pop over into those categories pretty easily. I went to, we went to a, a weight loss clinic. So I did not go through my doctor. And um, so it's expensive because mm -hmm. it's not, I'm not getting this as a prescribed drug. I'm paying over the counter for it. So yep. I wanted to kind of tell everybody how this is working for us. So we went to, um, to a, a weight loss clinic, but they do, um, it's a, it's a, a health, I don't even know what they, a wellness clinic. So they do mm -hmm. biotox, you know, Botox, Botox and, uh -huh. and, you know, injections and blah, blah, blah. They do all these amazing things and skin stuff and, and they, you know, and everybody looks so magic, amazing, amazing when they're there. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so we, so we all went to this particular um, group here in Florida and, um, and like I said, so we pay out of pocket. So it ends up being about a hundred dollars a week per person per injection in doing all the research. So you can see that there's a lot of, of research to do. I didn't want to do something that was that if I did go off of it, I was going to go blue and right back up. I've had mm -hmm. too much experience in this. I know I have to have an end game and my end game is not to come off of it and then go back up to 200 pounds. And so, um, <clears throat> so we talked a lot to you about like, how do I, how do we make sure that we don't have that problem and things like that. And, and your information was very similar to the information that we had read. We watched another really great podcast episode and I went to look for it to, to tell everybody what it was here in this episode, but I couldn't find it. So I'll find it and mm. I'll link that in the episode as well in the show notes. There's a ton of information out there. You can look on YouTube, see everybody's different journeys. Everybody's journey is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the typical side effects that you mentioned, like the nausea, the, the, um, Headaches, tired, being tired is a really mm. big one too. And um, you mentioned the, but constipation also on the other end of that too. Mm. So it can, it can have those types of side effects. We all decided to, to go for it and try it bottom line. And um, so I'm going to speak to my experience and we're all going to eventually talk about this, I think, because I think people want to know, because we've had four very different experiences oh. um, on this drug. Yeah. And so eat, all of us started off, actually, they started us off at 0.25, which if you go to the doctor, mm -hmm. the starting dose is 0.5. So this place even started us off on 0.25. And I was so grateful that they did because I had, I was the one who had the most um, symptoms after the first shot, everybody else was kind of okay with it. Um, I had a lot of nausea that first week I had, I was the one that was like, I don't even feel like eating. Like I totally get that. And I've heard it's like pregnancy nausea. Yeah. Which yes, is terrible, which is terrible. You're just like, ah, oh, I have to eat something. It's a cracker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, and if you don't, it's You're almost gonna... like you have to catch it right at that moment or it mm. pushes into like, I really am going to throw up kind of a thing. But that's mm -hmm. my, that's my nausea state anyways. That's like, even my hot flash nausea was always like, okay. That. So I, I know my nausea really, really well. And so I know like the instant, if I don't do something in the next three minutes, I'm going to feel like really gross, but it's only going to last like five minutes and things like that. So, but mine, um, yeah. So my, my first week was really, really rough. The things that they tell you to make sure is that you get a lot of protein, and, um, and then the, the fatty foods and things like that, you can still eat all the things you could, like you just said, like we, I, I really assumed a lot was going to be different. Like it's not, it just, it does just curb your hunger. So those things don't even act interesting. Like I love fried chicken. That's kind of my thing. Like I'm more of a carb girl than a sweet girl. So like I could pass up a cute piece of cake, but I put a piece of fried chicken in front of me, like I'm in trouble. <laughs> and so, so that's kind of like, I, I do love a piece of fried chicken. And so even when we first started taking it, I'm like, I could not even like the, thinking about the grease in a piece of fried chicken just made me want to, you know, and I'm like, Ooh, if this is the way that this is going to be forever, that's great. What I didn't understand, because they I, they can only tell you so much, but the drug wears off and that's why you do mm. it on a weekly basis. So you take mm -hmm. the shot, it's every once a week. Um, you can always do it later than you do it. So you can do it more than seven days out, but you can never do it any earlier than seven days out. And so it does start to taper off. And so we didn't know that and didn't understand how it was going to affect your body. And I think everybody's a little bit different. So after that first week for me, everything started to taper off and took my second injection, stayed at the 0.25. And then that was when, for me, it was like the clouds lifted, Tanisha. It mm. was, I, in case you guys don't remember me talking about it at all. So this was in January. We started, we're on our 11th week. We started this right after the new year. 
my January was horrible. My December was awful. My hor- December, my January was terrible. I was under so much stress at work and my mom and everything. That second week, and that's when I was doing that big conference. And I'm, I mean, I was really on edge. Like I didn't think I was going to make it. I thought I was going to have to like not be able to do my job. It was, mm. I was having such a hard time with anxiety and depression and um, stress and just awful. Just everything was just, I was out of control. So I was like, well, we're going to do this anyways, whatever, and um, never even knew or or understood that it could have um, benefits for stress and anxiety. And that second week, it was like the clouds lifted and I was a brand new person again. And it was like I had felt a year before. It was so crazy that the stress and the anxiety melted away. And I I'm instantly said to everybody, is this drug, is this is this the semaglutide that's doing this? Is this supposed to do this? And um, the practitioner that I went to said, well, we've heard people talk about that that's a benefit for them, that they feel less stress and anxiety. So I started doing some research. Well, it turns out that it is incredibly helpful that they're finding a lot of people are having, are reporting a lot of relief from stress and anxiety and depression when they are now on the semaglutide or one of those uh, peptide type things. But the semi-glutide is the one that seems to help more with, I think, the depression. It just happens to be the one that I'm on. And so um, so it's fascinating that this total separate side piece for me was more of a game changer than anything else that I've been able to deal with in a while. So um, I don't know how all that works. Like I said, I started to do some research about They're starting to do research on it. You talked about the fact that the drug, um, we don't know what the repercussions are going to be down the road, mm-hmm. but I do when in doing our research, you know, the drug's been around for 20 years because they, it was a diabetic drug. They just don't know what it's going to do for those of us who aren't diabetic that are using it. I have a couple thoughts there. I have a question. Were you pre-diabetic? No, not, not, um, not at all. Because uh, my not, thought, a board, border, enough borderline to where um, my numbers were high every once in a while. You know, and so then- I'm wondering, I'm always want I always want to know the mechanism. Okay. How did that help your mood? I'm wondering if you were having these blood sugar spikes and dips and stress, like, because when you go into stress and anxiety, fight or flight, you use a lot of your glucose storage to make cortisol and energy and things like that. So I'm wondering if you were having, maybe you weren't pre-diabetic, but Perhaps you were going into hypoglycemia, hyper, hype, you know, you were having your, your blood sugars kind of following your anxiety. That that's one thought. And did it level out your blood sugars? And so you're not having these major dips that follow the stress. And so you feel more balanced. That's, that's one thought. My, my other thought is something going on with your GI tract because, and I don't, I don't know the, I don't know the actual biochemistry behind exactly what the drug could do there, but we've talked about more serotonin is made in your gut lining. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That's interesting about it. I mean, definitely I would expect energy as you're losing weight energy to increase, which obviously helps mood, but actual depression and anxiety miss lifting. There's gotta be a mechanism to that, that that's making sense. I have heard patients say that if you inject it into your abdomen versus your thigh, for whatever reason, people seem to have less side effects, GI issues, nausea, for whatever reason. I don't know why, but I've heard a couple of people say that. Never, I don't know if that's um, true. Yeah. You do your own self-injection, by the way. So yeah. for anybody who doesn't want to do that, but it is the tiniest little needle. It is like, it's, you know, it's even... subcutaneous, right? It, like it just goes under nope. the skin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a ti- it... you don't have to do it like a sub Q injection where you're going underneath just your, the dirt, you, you stick it in, but it's just a tiny, it's just a tiny little needle. So, uh, and then the other thing I was gonna say that I think it's absolutely, I think you're absolutely right. It is something to do with the, with my blood sugar levels and the insulin and how all that's being. And so the food that I'm not eating or not getting the right foods or the things or whatever that is, I a million percent instantly thought it's clearly because now my, my body is able to slowly dose out the, the, the insulin, because that's what the medication is doing is Mm -hmm. making that stay there. And then, um, and then of course eating a little bit better and things like that. So I'm sure, and like I said, I'm I'm sure they will do a ton of different research on this and, and, um, and all of the things like you're saying, yes, the energy and the stuff like that too, but I, I'm sure it's all related. And, um, but for me, it was so, it was so, so palpable. I mean, it was good. 
it was crazy. Now I will also say, so we're 11 weeks in, I'm now up to the second dose, which now I'm at 0.5, which is where most people who are medically prescribed, they, they're at that dose, get a little bit of tire. I get my doses on Monday. I get a little tired Monday, maybe a little bit into Tuesday, but that's probably about it. And then for me, so the one thing I do want to say, I did watch the Oprah special too. And um, I felt it was good. It was very cursory. It was very, um, it was very surface. She didn't mm -hmm. do a lot of deep dive into Science, it. Yeah. It was an Oprah mm -hmm. show, you know, yeah, yeah. It, she could only, she had 47 minutes, you know, and had to get everybody in. And, and so I would have loved to have it been a four hour show and for her to really dive into it because um, she didn't really get into a lot of the medical stuff and things like that, but, but it was really right. good. But the thing that was so palpable for me in watching that show is in knowing that she's dealt with weight all of her life that in talking about the fat shaming and I do it myself even, and I'm overweight and I'm not healthy. And I look at other people and sometimes go, oh, I wish they, you know, what can they do to help themselves? And I'm like, oh man, that's, that's not okay. Cause I'm, I'm the same way. And so, um, but it was so interesting hearing her talk about that. And then the other piece was that I never really thought about, but the semaglutide, what it has done for me, it's talk, it's turned off all the food talk in my head. Mm. And I didn't really realize that I have it. And I don't know that I have it as badly, but I, um, I was always thinking about what there is to eat and what the next thing is to eat and what am I in the mood to eat? And so it was always about what's going to taste good or what's going to, what am I craving. And that's almost how I approached every single meal. And now um, it's helped me curb some of that. So I'm super positive, not positive. I'm super encouraged that I will be able to change my own habits mm -hmm. because now when we go out, the four of us go out, we can't, we get two meals and we can't finish them for four people because we're all getting so full so quickly. <clears throat> so I realize I'm eating much more of what a normal sized plate should look like. You know, I don't think, you know, on Weight Watchers where they tell you, you should eat, you know, the meat that's mm -hmm. the palm of your hand. Well, this is the palm of my hand. Yeah. You know? And for me, yeah. it's like, no, ma'am, really, this is the palm. Nope. This is my hand. See how big my hand is, you know? And I would, I would take every little inch of anything that they gave me, but now guess what? I really only need a piece of meat that this big, because that's all I need. But, and if I need to eat something in three hours, eat something in three hours, it's totally fine. Go grab some fruit. Nuts or, or uh, something. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Nuts. Yeah. Something protein. That's the big thing. Just like little protein bar, stuff like that. So that was the yeah. big thing for me is that it, it, it did quiet the new food noise in my head, which I didn't even really think about until Oprah said it that way, that it, it quieted the food voices in her head. And I was like, holy shit, that's exactly what that is. It's, you know, and that's amazing to turn that off. If you, if you don't know that you have that. I think you touched on something huge, right? Is we stop looking at food as fuel and we've looked at it as enjoyment and all the things, which I'm married to a chef, y'all. <laughs> I get it. There is nothing better than eating at a Michelin star restaurant with all the wine pairings and the pleasure of that, which is, you know, one of our most exciting vacations we like to do is go places for restaurant reservations, being a chef, um, being married to a chef. But that's not, that's not how we should look at food, in my opinion, every day food is, is fueling us, feeding us. It's either helping or, or hurting us, right? It's either inflaming us or healing us and looking at it really is, you know, source of life. And what we put in our body is what our cells are going to look like and, and be, we've gotten so far in our society away from that is food should be enjoyment. Food should be stress relief. Shoot. Food is, you know, if it tastes good, yeah, you're going to eat it all kind of thing. And, and I, and I think you're right that that's the big, that's, that's a big shift. If you can make that kind of shift of, okay, I'm eating because I have to sustain life. And I want to give my body the things that feed me and truly heal me. And I'm glad the clinic you mentioned going to, or they mentioned protein because protein is probably the biggest thing lacking in the American diet, right? They call it the stat, the sad diet, the standard American diet is a lot of refined carbohydrates and sugars and less protein and fruits and vegetables kind of thing. So, so I think a lot of it is, is how you manage it on the, how you manage diet on the drug and, and turning off that thought of, you know, I'm eating this cause it feels good. My concern with some people that are eating less is, are they becoming nutritionally deficient? And we've run some of those labs on patients where they are missing, you know, their B vitamins are really low, their minerals are low because they're just not eating much. So, so the big thing I've been preaching to patients on it is, 
you know, you're not hungry, but you have to eat. So let's just make a really good choice and give your body some, feed your body some really good nutrients that you're going to absorb and you're going to utilize. Of course, if you're not having the diarrhea, (laughs) you'll absorb and utilize. Yeah. Better best. Yeah. So, so that's, that's huge. Yeah. I love when she said that and gosh, when she said something along the lines of when Oprah said, um, dinner table jokes or something in America, like I forget exactly how she, she said it exactly, but gosh, she's right. That broke my heart, but yeah, I can't even imagine the, 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 what she lived with that having people talk about her weight in that manner forever. And still, still, yeah, yeah still. Oh, look, she's that. skinny now. Now she's fat again. Like it's terrible. Yeah, it is terrible. It is terrible. And we do see it as a sign of, um, you know, not healthy and yeah. 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 And she admits a lot of hers was emotional eating from trauma yeah. and abuse and things like that. But the other thing too, is I think that, and what I love is that people coming around and talking about obesity as a, as a disease, as things, because yeah, all that stuff, even though I, everybody emotionally eats, not everybody's body stores the fat and and bodies react that way. Yeah. And so that's that's the other thing too. So that's where just like every a lot of people drink. I drink a lot. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm I don't have that predisposition. I might could be if I really worked hard at it, but I mean I drink a lot and I'm not. I just it's, it just doesn't affect my body that way. I don't have that type of a whatever that is. And um and so I think that that that's legitimate. I think that people are just more predisposed to some things than others and obesity is part of it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and yes, yeah. we do, contr- we do control it in the sense of you have to eat, but if your your body, it's just like mental health, if your body, if the brand, if the connections aren't being made, it, it, it may not be your fault. It, and there's nothing that you can't see. You can't, mm-hmm. you can't force that wiring of that brain. If something's just misfiring in your, the depression or whatever those things are, they just need, you need help to get over those things. And the, that's what obesity can be too, you know? Absolutely. So the other thing too, I wanted to, to point about that, um, to point out about the, to point out about that, um, was that I am probably one of those people that right now I am losing muscle mass. Um, but I think the most important thing is to be very, very aware and be very proactive and, um, aware of yourself. Like don't, this isn't going to be the miracle drug that's going to save you. And then you go off of it. And I don't, and Oprah said something about it while being on it for life. And I was like, wait, do I, I don't want to be on this for for my Mm. life. I would like, I would love for my, now, if my body cannot do what it needs to do, like, is my body not being able to process these things, but is that environmental too? We don't know Look, all these toxins, mm-hmm. all these molds and things like that. Maybe that's why our receptors aren't working as well mm-hmm. as they did a hundred years ago for people. You know, obesity wasn't a problem, but now Absolutely. it is. And so we don't know what those things are that are causing those issues, but, um, but I'm so aware of those things. So I'm like, I know, I know if I stopped right now, I would go back up because my, sh- my, not my sugar cravings, but my giving into sugar has definitely come back. Like it's Easter. And one of my favorite, like I don't, I'm more of a jelly bean type person than chocolate. So, so like those jelly candies, like the worst refined sugar that there is, that's the thing that I like. And so like the other day I caught myself, I have a bag, I bought a bag of jelly bean stuff and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to throw the rest of these away, but I ate some and I didn't want to I don't want to beat myself up for it. It's okay because there's going to be times where you, you have, I have to learn how to handle those things Mm -hmm. by sticking my head in the sand saying, well, I'm never going to eat another jelly bean. That's ridiculous, you know, or never going to eat another ice cream cone. I I know, but, but if I'm gonna, then how do I do that? And yeah, you have to live, right? We have to live. I'm a big fan of 80, 20 rules. I'd like to live 90, 10, where if I'm eating well and working out and staying focused 80% of the time when I have it, the 20% of the time, it doesn't derail me. It doesn't change the scale significantly. I don't feel so bad. However, I have learned the cleaner you eat, the they call it like lean and green and clean, the the leaner and greener you eat, you do kind of bastardize yourself when you do go off the rails because you just feel so bad because your body's like, what is this poison you're putting in my body? We've been eating so good. Um, but usually when you eat well, 80% percent of the time you're conscious of it. You're doing water, you're sleeping, you're working out. The 20% isn't going to put you into a place of obesity. So that's where I'm a big fan of 
people getting the weight off, making the changes and keeping the changes off kind of with that 80, 20 or again, I'd like to say 90, 10 is our goal for sure. If we're eating well, 90% of the time, the 10% is not going to, it's not going to kill us. Other things probably will first versus somebody who eats fast food 80% of the time. Yeah. The food's going to kill you. Yep. Yep. You're going to have a heart attack. That's what's going to happen. You know, kind of thing that that's for sure. We know that to be true. So, so yeah, like I said, there's so much to it and it's become such a trend and it is expensive. I I've heard it can be on the upside of $600 a month, a kind of thing, four to 600 a month with, so to think about people going off of it and gaining it all back, a, that's harder on your heart than just carrying the, the weight, right. Going up and down like that. But, but B yeah, you don't, you don't want that to happen. Yeah. You don't want to spend all that time and money and effort and, and rebound with it too. So so yeah, it sounds like you guys are really focused on on making sure that doesn't happen. Phoenix and Crimson have been much more committed to getting to the gym <laughs> than than we have. Uh, mine's more of a afternoon walk or a little bit of, of resistance training. But I know I need to start all that stuff, and it's it's on it's part of what's you know coming along as I get some of my life back. And I tell you what, I'm t- this some the depression kind of lifting up a little bit, although that has come back a little bit too. Um, again, so it's not because it's not a magic pill. Mm -hmm. Uh, but so some of that, like uh, last week was the first time that I was kind of like, Ooh, I'm having a a depressed day and I haven't had that in about three months. And Mm. so it, yeah. So I, you know, I, I was able to realize it and, um, but it, I could feel, I could feel it and it, it came and went, it was just a quick, you know, it was just kind of a one day, but it was kind of a funk day and I'm like, okay, so it's not cured. I'm not cured. Uh, which makes sense because all the stressors haven't gone away. The stressors mm-hmm. are just as bad. As a matter of fact, they're worse right now. And so, um, but I'm so much better handling them right now because of, with the help of this. So, I, you know, I think I'd I'd be, I'm very pleased with the results that we're getting so far. I'm pleased with, um, we've had relatively minimal side effects for everybody. We started off very slowly, very, very slowly. I think Tristan's the only one that and he had the most weight to lose. I think he's the only one that's gone up even the next level of dosage. I think we're all still at even just the beginning, beginning dose. And I don't, I don't even know that I'll need to go. Maybe I'll go up one more, but we'll probably start to taper back down too and see how that, or just stay here as long as I can, and see if I can mentally, as I'm reprogramming now that I want the jelly beans because. A month ago, I wouldn't even want to, I wouldn't even have bought the mm-hmm. jelly beans. Now it's a month and I did buy the jelly beans and I ate the jelly beans. So it's like, okay, but now say, okay, but I don't help now help the mental process. Okay. So I'm, I'm recognizing the flags and that's yeah. a big piece. And losing it slow in my experience with, with patients and myself is more sustainable too, than losing a lot really fast. Um, may I ask how much, and I don't, I hate to use the word weight loss. I like to say weight release. You've released it. How much weight have you guys released in 11 weeks? If you don't mind sharing. I don't mind. And if sharing. you do just edit that out. No, no, I don't <laughs> mind sharing mine. I don't want to answer for anybody else. Cause again, I, we're all going to talk mm-hmm. about it eventually, but, um, but I think mine is very common for, for all of us. I think at this point, it's been 11 weeks. I think I am right at about 20 pounds from, okay. from the highest I was, which was right before we started. So I even, cause right, I think I lost, a, I had lost a couple pounds. I, I'm not one that weighs all the time. So I had very sporadic uh, weight records before we started. So I, I went back about two weeks before we even started. Cause that was a little bit higher because I really feel like that was kind of in that window. So yeah, so I'm like, I'm at like right about 20 pounds in, in, in those 11. So two pounds a week. week. That's yeah. according to Weight Watchers. Yeah. That's perfect, right? That's sustainable weight loss to keep off versus if you guys probably did go up really fast, right? It'd probably be more like five or six pounds a week. And, and that's where we see more of the rebound too. Right. Which sounds I good, think- right? But then if it's going to come back, yeah, the body can release that, that little, because what, the other thing when you lose weight, the unless you get liposuction, the fat cells aren't gone. They shrink. So what was in them that came out when they shrunk, right? Because they talk about, I hope they talk about this in that clinic, but drinking all your water, right? Because you're flushing the fat. We're not flushing fat. You're flushing junk that was in that cell. And that's where we see it can be chemicals. I mean, we talked about parabens. It can be excess hormones. It can be toxins. It can be things like mold, heavy metal. Like that's what's in the fat 
air that we breathe. It's you, I mean, you're absolutely right. A hundred years ago, obesity wasn't a thing because we, I, I believe, and I have seen we weren't in as toxic of a world. So when you're, when those fat cells are shrinking, everything in the fat cell is flushing out and, and it could be just adipose fat tissue, some of it, but a lot of it's toxin. So that's probably somewhat maybe of the, the mood stuff too. And, and we call toxins, I'm calling them toxins, a, a better word might be free radicals, things that are in the body that cause inflammation, right? Food dies. Our body doesn't know how to break that stuff down. Where does it go? It gets stored. Yeah. yeah. You know, food, we can't break down chemicals in the food. Where does that stuff go? It goes into our fat our fat cells. That's why when you eat things like McDonald's all the time, you get fat because a lot of that has chemicals and things in it too. And so, yeah, I bet that's a big part of it. All of that's leaving. So, so two pounds a week is solid. That's good. That's really good. That's not rapid weight loss. Right. No, I've been, I've been very pleased with it. And there have been times where I go up after a weekend because that's when the medicine for us, cause we go on Monday. So the, we're at our lowest amount still left in our system. And then that's the weekend. And that's when you're eating and drinking. But, um, so, but which is all inflammatory. I, yep. Pardon? Drinking, which the drinking is inflammatory. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So the right. weight goes up. Yep. And so pretty normal with, um, with me. And so I, I, I think I might go up like a pound or a pound and a half over a weekend, but then by the end of the week down two pounds. So it, it's that, that, that little bit kind of fluctuates off and on mm -hmm. the same time, the same amount of the week, but then I continue to can, to just drop a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. So I'm very comfortable with that. And I know that I'm eating better. Or mm -hmm. I'm eat, I'm paying more attention to what I'm eating and I'm making sure I'm like, oh, you know, I haven't, I was hungry, but I don't need as much. So I maybe only grabbed um, like a piece of chicken out of the fridge or I only grabbed a, a bowl of carrots or something like that. Actually, I don't normally go to carrots. I go to even just a handful of crackers. Maybe I just needed something quick or a handful of nuts. Then I'll go, oh man, I haven't had a vegetable all day today. I better make sure I have a salad you know, as, or a bowl, some kind of bowl or something for dinner. So it, it's helping me be more aware of just mentally checking in with my own self, all those things I do anyways, but it's just because it's, I know that I'm have to pay more attention to it right now. So it's becoming more habit forming. And so I, I like that it's, it's, it's going well. That's awesome. I'm excited yeah. to hear it. Yeah. 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 That's good. And and I think you're right. When you spend that kind of time and money and effort, you are going to be conscious of what you're putting in your body. And I, I, I am looking into other resources and things like that. So I think my, the thing I would tell people, if you're interested in learning about this, I would definitely talk to your healthcare provider first um, because they can prescribe it and then you can get it through your insurance and insurance will cover it if you meet the criteria to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, again, we chose not to do it that way just because honestly, we were, um, it can take three months to get an appointment with your doctor these days if you're not, if there's something isn't wrong. And so it was like, we didn't want to wait three months anymore and uh, we were ready to go. And so it was kind of like, well, we can, we can do it. So, so we'll do it. Um, and now that we're seeing success with it, it was like, oh, you know what? Maybe we do need to see about seeing our doctor or seeing a different practitioner or, or an actual practitioner that mm -hmm. maybe can give us a little bit of a discount with it and and something like that. So we're researching into that a little bit more. But but I would definitely suggest going through your your doctor first. The you still have to meet the guidelines. You still the, the any reputable. Let me put it reputable. this way: any yeah. reputable clinic. <laughs> You may not have to meet the guidelines if you find some of these places, but you also don't know what you're getting. And at our at our clinic where we go to, they actually um, have their have the semaglutide compounded with vitamin uh, with B12, and so it is not. Um, oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So they actually are having it compounded, and so check with the company, check with whoever wherever you're going. If you are going to a clinic versus your doctor, um, make sure check and see what they're where they're getting the medication from. So our particular. Um, clinic wasn't affected when there was a little bit of a shortage because they don't use the actual brand. Um, but we wanted to make sure we went with a reputable clinic that's using a reputable pharmacy that's compounding a reputable compounding pharmacy that's doing the drug. So do a little bit of research because it, you know, it's, it, um, they're not find anything on the internet. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's, so that, go through your that's great provider. advice. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I highly ad advocate going through your healthcare provider first, monetarily wise, plus your doctor knows what's going on with you. Plus they can also track all those things. If you've been borderline high blood pressure and high cholesterol, all those things, they're going to want to know what you're doing and help you through that process because mm -hmm. they're going to want to monitor all that stuff. So I do advocate going through your, your practitioner. Um, Tristan was the one that 
for him, it takes the longest to get his appointment. And so it was like, we, we knew we didn't want to wait that long. So he'll get an appointment with his doctor, bring her up to speed on everything. Um, but so it's not that we didn't want to go through them. It was just, it was truly a, a we were, we were um, Americans and we wanted fast action. Yeah. <laughs> Convenience. Yeah. We you made know, our choice. Advice. We made our decision and that's what we did, you know, but we could afford to do it. So, um, but it has been, it's a game changer for me. I think it's been a game changer for all four of us. Um, everybody is seeing relatively good results with it. And so, um, but for me, it's the mental piece that has been the biggest, the biggest, biggest piece for me, just huge. And I think out of the four of us, I'm the one that's seen the most benefit for myself this way. That's awesome. Um, not all of them are experiencing any kind of this fog lifting for themselves, but for me, it's just been wonderful. So that's huge. I, I'm, I'm excited to hear that. That's yeah. Good. Thanks. I and like I mean, hearing the good stories from it. Yeah. It, for sure. it's, yeah. And all those things, you know, the, the, the side effects you have to be very aware of, be just know your body, you know, know if the things that yeah. you're eating are causing you more, or are they causing you more constipation, you know, be just pay attention and you have to mm -hmm. be aware. But I really wanted to share this piece with everyone because it's such a hot topic right now. It is. Um, but I think there, the more we all talk about it, the more people are going to be able to make good choices. And I, my thing, just do your research, do your research, do your research. You have to, same thing with just the lifestyle. You have to decide what your risk assessment is. Is it worth it for you to try it and do it? And then what's, what's your exit strategy when that ends? And if mm -hmm. you are not a person who sticks with something well, or you've always ballooned back up, maybe this isn't thing for you or, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, but, um, but definitely do the research and it's, you're going to find something to agree with whatever it is that you want to hear. But so read the other stuff too. <laughs> and just knowing there's options out there, right. And how it's working. Yeah. No, I think that's great, great info. I'm excited. Yeah, for And they even talked about it on the Oprah special about how the, the one mom and the daughter that were both obese and both struggling, that the medication was working better for the daughter than it was for the mm -hmm. mom, but the mom can't afford to, to not get the prescribed medication that mm -hmm. she was able to get. So I think everybody does look, you know, works a little bit differently. And that one, I forget which one it was. It's not, it's a different one than what we're taking, but so they do work differently and some are more yeah. effective than others. So that's why it's good to go with the, with your actual healthcare provider, because they can watch all that for you and re-prescribe if the ones that's not working, isn't working. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's great advice. Well, um, I think that's about it for us today. We I covered so a lot. Glad. There was a lot. I know. And I'm like, can we just squeeze these two little topics in <laughs> under this one hour conversation? We always go over an hour anyways. But but I felt like it was really important because I think it's so important for women to know that your body is going to go through some changes or that if you're going through changes, you're not crazy. That like all of a sudden you're yes. having problems and you weren't because that's what I thought. I didn't realize. I didn't, you know, the first thing actually, when you look up BV, one of the first um or not symptoms of uh, causes is multiple sex partners, new or multiple sex partners. It's like You're one like, of the very oh. first thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, well that explains that. Yeah. But no one ever told me. So, um, so I think it's just really important to understand your health and your care and your own body and things like that. But then also, um, wanted to take a minute and talk about the semaglutide. So thank you for hanging with me while we talked about that and your, your points of view of it, um, and your experience with it. Cause it, the more people, more information we give, the more prepared people will be. And again, always thank you for being so transparent. I know it helps people. And you're right. I think that's something that all women, yeast infections, bacterial vaginosis that are experiencing in the lifestyle, but nobody talks about it. Nobody's talking about it. You're not like, hey, guess what I was going on last week? It was I a rough when, week. No one's we, talking about it. <laughs> I know when we have our um, community, so we have a, a community that people can join if you're interested. In that community, uh, I actually have a women's, a private women's group. So when you join the community, we always tell the, the couples, they each have to join and create their own profile. We do it through Discord. So it can be totally anonymous so that people, you can even sign up under uh, your, your screen name, your profile name. So you don't have to use a real name at all. That's why we chose Discord. Discord. But uh, so we have a private women's group. And so the women have to contact me directly. And then we let them in. And I said, and I get very when we do calls and stuff like that, I am very, 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 very particular about keeping a safe space. And and mm -hmm. almost like I love the word that everybody's using now kind of have, creating a container. And you're creating that container of safe space for the women's group. And so when we're on zoom calls, I always ask the women don't please be in a room where your husband or nobody else mm -hmm. can be and where they're not going to walk in on you. And even if you're wearing headphones, 
I don't, I prefer them not being around because you're not going to talk as openly as freely if they're there. But I also mm -hmm. personally do not want your husband hearing about my bacterial vaginosis <laughs> problems because <laughs> God forbid I hit it off with your husband someday and he'd be like, oh yeah, but she got BV. You know, I'm not that that would happen, but it's like, I or, and or vice versa. You don't want to be talking about something and Tristan walk through the room and he'll be yeah. like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that Tanisha's got yeast infections going on again or something, you know? <laughs> So, but we you never thought you'd say on camera. Right? Did you ever think that would come out of your mouth? Yeah. But we do. We talk about those things because that is so that is so important. We and we share a lot of resources and information with each other. So, um, so yeah. So please, I love we'll it. Get you and Dr. Awards will get you. It's in. so needed. It's so needed in this space in yeah. life. Women and tribes we, in life are needed. But I love that you're doing this. Thank you. Thank you. And um, and th I hope everybody else finds this the helpful. I hope you find some nuggets of wisdom. I hope you find something that you can take away with you or at least some information to help feed your your desire to learn more. If you have any um, questions about the semaglutide, the weight loss stuff, anything about yeah. your um, body changing, talk to your practitioner, find somebody else that can help you with that. Join our community. We'll all be talking and, and trading, trading our tips and tricks in there um, and all the the things that we love and try. That's how we actually that's how mm -hmm. I found out about the love honey. That's all my my friends and buddies. Mm -hmm. We talk about what we carry in our, I call it my slut bag, my bag that I take with me on, <laughs> to play dates and play parties, my slut bag, my condoms that I like, my lube that I like, who found this great travel packet of this amazing lube that they love. And it's like, yay, <laughs> you know? And so we share all that information. So, and having uh, a space to talk about it without shame is so amazing. Yeah. And, 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 and without embarrassment and your practitioner, trust me, your practitioner has heard it. So whatever you can say, if they've, if they've been at it long enough, you're not going to throw them a curveball. So, so yeah, be transparent. All this stuff needs to be talked about. It's still scary. It's still scary it to is. talk to your practitioner about it. It is. So I'll tell everybody if you haven't heard the story, the secret, the the story that I told um, when I went to my practitioner when we first entered in the lifestyle, I did not have the nerve to tell her that I was a swigger. So I told her that Tristan and I had gotten separated and I was out dating and having a lot of sex. Yeah. And, and, you know, we should, and I came to... home and I told, Tr I came home though. And I totally told Tristan, I said, I threw your ass under the bus. And I said, we were separate because I, I wussed out at the last minute, but I needed <laughs> her to know I was having all this sex, but I didn't know what else to say. And like, she yeah. could even met him. She could care less. She doesn't even know who I am, but it was, and I, I share that story openly. Cause I'm like, that that's what I needed to do to get, I still needed to get the help and the information. And so mm -hmm. he's like, throw me under the bus. I'm like, I don't care. I said, good. Cause I did, but you know, well, I people know. like you are going to make that or are, are paving that way for it to not be so shameful or whatever, odd, different. And right. um, yeah, I love it, which is why I'm here. That's right. And <laughs> to be sexually active women in our 50s, how awesome is that? Well, you're not in your 50s yet. I'm in my 50s. But, you know, <laughs> as we mature, as we're getting older, to have all this life that's still left. And it's so exciting to have that. So I'm I want to think. tip to the other side. I'm getting close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't rush it. Don't rush it. Um, but I want to thank you so much for being here with me again today. I'm so excited for our next episode where we'll talk about my results. I guess we'll have to figure yes. out how that's going to go, but um, we'll do that in a couple of weeks. So Sounds great. we'll be back. So everybody keep your eyes peeled for that episode. It'll be out in a couple of weeks um, and we'll talk about my results and we'll see what, what I'm supposed to do from here. So we'll go. In the meantime, I'll get you all the recipes I mentioned yes. to make everything everywhere Perfect. healthier. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanisha Wards for being here. Um, where can everybody find you if they would like to find you to reach out to you? Yeah. My Instagram is drtanisha, D-R-T-E-N-E-S-H-A. That's probably the quickest way. And our practice is Infinity Wellness Center um, based in Austin, Texas, but we are telehealth na nationwide, but in Austin. Yep. So if you guys want to work with Dr. Tanisha, you can work with her. So- reach out to her infinity wellness center online and set up an appointment, reach out to her on Instagram. Um, her amazing clinical staff. They're also wonderful. Everybody's so nice and helpful. Oh, I'm um, so glad. But yeah, they are. They're great. Um, but thank you again for being here and thank you guys for listening to us. If you need anything from me, you know where to find me at accidental swingers on Instagram or Marina at accidentalswingers.com. If you want to shoot me an email, keep your stories coming. We would love to hear them. And um, if you have questions, send us your questions. That would be amazing. Mm. We will be doing a live, a live show at some point in time, probably within um 
well, this is March, so maybe May or so, beginning of May, um, to do a live show and, and answer your questions. But we'll make sure we get the information out about that as much as we can. We'll put it on the socials everywhere that we can um, so that you'll be aware of that. So make sure you follow both of our accounts on Instagram if you want to make sure that you catch that live, that live show. And uh, we'll let you know when that's going to be. So we'll see you in a few weeks. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Take care. Mm -hmm.